Is Putin looking to create some kind of not only military presence, but an alliance in the region, Syria, Iran, the Baghdad government in Iraq? He already has that alliance. He and basically, this is just putting the uh, icing on that cake. I would like to thank Russia's leadership and the Russian people for all the help they've given to Syria. If the West won't protect him from the unruly mobs, then Putin will. That is the case with Syria, Russia's closest ally in the Middle East. We're following breaking news overnight. The UK has voted in favor of leaving the European Union. The total number of votes cast in favor of leave was 82,000. You know, when I came here 17 years ago, and I said that I wanted to lead a campaign to get Britain to leave the European Union, you all laughed at me. Well, I have to say, you're not laughing now, are you? Today, the government acts on the democratic will of the British people, and it acts too on the clear and convincing position of this House. A few minutes ago in Brussels, the United Kingdom's permanent representative to the EU handed a letter to the President of the European Council on my behalf, confirming the government's decision to invoke Article 50 
of the Treaty on European Union. The Article 50 process is now underway and in accordance with the wishes of the British people, the United Kingdom is leaving the European Union. In a dramatic escalation, Fox News has learned Russia sent the largest shipment of missiles to date to Syria, a month after Russian President Vladimir Putin pledged to scale back his forces there. U.S. officials tell Fox in the past two days, Russia delivered 50 short-range ballistic missiles to the Syrian port of Tartus along the Mediterranean. Russian SS-21 missiles are called scarabs by NATO meant to destroy ground targets up to 100 miles away. Russia also recently fired six ballistic missiles from its air base in Syria against opposition fighters. It is not immediately clear if those opposition fighters were backed by the United States. Russia also completed delivery of its S-300 missile components to Iran, according to Russia's envoy to the Islamic Republic. U.S. officials say Russia still maintains nearly 50 jets, helicopter gunships, and drones in Syria. It's uh, really nice to be here again for our second session and this time it's uh, Russia and the Church and uh, as I said in the last session, these, it's very much going to overlap into Israel and the Middle East because a lot of Russia, what Russia is now doing, as you can see by that video, is actually in the Middle East. So um, it is quite astounding the way things are going. Now we did start, we started of course our first session by really emphasising the practical importance of Bible prophecy and, and I, I re-emphasise that really again. The fact that this is not just some academic uh, in interest or exercise that we're carrying out, we're simply, it, it, it's not a simple academic um, study. It is really a look into the mind of God to actually see the actual mind of God and how God sees the kingdoms of this world. Now, of course, Daniel is a classic example of that. Let's go to Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4 and verse 17. Of course, Daniel was a man who had incredible passion for what he believed. In fact, when Daniel was shown some of these prophecies, he actually became so sick that he actually was sick for three... In one case, he was actually sick for three weeks. Daniel 4 verse 17 says, This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living might know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. That, that literally means he sets up over the kingdoms of this world the lowest of men. And I believe that that is or, uh, really ultimately speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the, the lowest of men. The Septuagint version says, he who is set at naught of men. That is what Bible prophecy is all about. It's getting life into perspective. The kings of this earth are here today and they're gone tomorrow. A lot of these people we've seen up on the screen that are doing God's will, they're here today and they're gone tomorrow. But we also see that re-emphasised again on a number of other occasions. Have a look at also Daniel 4 and verse 25, at the end of verse 25. 
Nebuchadnezzar was told that he would know that seven times would pass over him until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Also, chapter, or chapter 4, verse 32. You will eat grass like the oxen as seven times will pass over you until you know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and he gives it to whomsoever he will. And it's also mentioned in, in um, chapter 5. To have a look at the end of verse 21 of chapter 5. And this is in the context of the fall of Babylon in the great night of, of, uh, of Babylon's partying in Babylon just before it fell. And it says there, the Jew, in, in remembering what happened to Nebuchadnezzar, it says that the, the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men that he appoints over it whomsoever he will. And thou, his son Belshazzar, has not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this. So he was someone who was a king of Babylon at the time who knew, he knew all of, all of this, just like we knew, know all of this as well. But he had not decided to respond to that. And really that's a huge challenge, isn't it, for all of us. I'm sure all of us feel the, the weight of that, that we see these events like we've just seen in a very short little video clip on the screen. We've seen those events. We know all this. But to actually make that a power and an urgency in our lives is another thing again, isn't it? It's one thing to be here at Bible school and actually be determined and be excited about what, we're, what is happening in the world and, and about our Bible studies. It is another thing again, isn't it, to really make this powerful in the, in the lives in which we live. And that's what I suppose is the real challenge that we take away from tonight. That it's, it's wonderful to see the work of God in the nations. But ultimately this must have a personal impact upon us, that the vision of the kingdom might, become, might continue to be very clear in our minds, that we might see above the problems of this world. Now, of course, Daniel saw that, didn't he, in Daniel chapter 2. And we, we used that, uh, that chapter in our uh, public lectures and in our seminars to talk about the end of the kingdom of men. But prophetically... What is very powerful about those chapters of chapter 2 and chapter 7 is that it forms really a very much a foundation for the continuous historic understanding of prophecy because the kingdoms there, kingdoms number 1, 2, 3 and 4 are progressive, they're sequential and they're continuous. They're uniquely numbered 1st, 2nd, 3rd and 4th. And we know from Daniel chapter 2 that there will be a, in, in some way a combination of all four empires existing at the time of the end, all absorbed into the Roman Empire. So we're hoping to see, we're, we're looking to see and we're starting to see it now, a revival of the Roman Empire at the time of the end allied with latter-day counterparts in some way of Medo-Persia, I suppose that's the area of Iran, wider area, of Greece, the old Greek Empire, but also Iraq, that area of Babylon and the old Babylonish Empire. Daniel 2 tells us that that empire is broken in pieces together. So it's the feet that's struck by Christ and the saints, but the whole lot is broken in pieces together. In other words, it's one large alliance. So what we're looking to see, in effect, is a re-emergence of the Roman Empire, both east and west, Russia moving south to recreate the eastern Roman Empire, allying itself with the, with the European Union in the west, but also bringing in Iran, Iraq and other eastern countries into its alliance. And that really, as that um, video started, that video tonight started with an interview that was given with Russian military leadership on the day that Russia moved into Syria. And the, the qu simple question was, well, do you think Mr Putin is trying to create some sort of alliance in the region? which the answer was, well, yes, he's already got that alliance. He's now just trying to put the icing on that cake. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for an alliance of these uh, ancient empires in some way when, um, at, at, the, at the time when Christ comes. But when we come to Daniel 7, and this is what we're going to really focus on tonight, 
Daniel chapter 7 gives further explanation of what's not given in chapter 2. And in case we might have thought maybe there is a fifth empire, Daniel chapter 7 shows us that there is only four empires and that the fourth beast is the final empire to be destroyed. Yes, it's in alliance with the previous three, but it's the fourth beast that's destroyed by Christ. In other words, we're looking for the main power to exist when Christ comes to be the Roman Empire. There's no fifth beast. Let's have a look at this. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 7. After this I saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. Now that's an inter- it's a strange sort of thing to say. Stamp the residue with the feet of it. It's also repeated again, that comment, Later on in the chapter, it's at the end of verse 19. And this beast was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. This is just a completely different beast all over again. And it had ten horns. This, of course, is developed further in the book of Revelation and and explained as being seen through the Roman Empire, through the ages, continuing through until when Christ comes and even after Christ comes. So it's the Roman Empire that is destroyed when he comes. I considered the horns and behold, there came up among them another little horn. This is the, 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 notice the clear, concise language. He's looking at the horns, the independent nations of Europe, and there came up among them. It's among them. This is a European horn. It says, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots and behold in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. Now we see through Daniel chapter 7 the real dramatic aspect of this fourth beast is the fact that it has this blasphemous little horn with a mouth speaking great words. Look at verse 11. I saw the voice of the... I kept looking because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. Verse 20, he was looking again and he said, look, this is a, had a mouth that spoke great things whose look was more stout than its fellows. In other words, this is a proud power. Verse 25, he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. Verse 26 says, but judgment shall sit and they... They, being the saints of verses 21 and 22, the saints shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it unto the end. Now, within Europe, developed in the Dark Ages, the Holy Roman Empire, headed by the Roman Catholic system and particularly the Pope, the Holy See, with a mouth that spoke great things. But Daniel 7 is saying that when Christ comes back and the saints take the kingdom, they will actually take away his dominion. And that's telling us that the Roman Empire will exist when Christ comes and the little horn will exist when Christ comes. And it says in verse 27, and the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominion shall serve and obey him. So we're looking to see that system of the revival of the Roman Empire at the end with a Catholic little horn in Europe speaking great things in a position of power and of arrogance. And that, of course, is developed much further in Revelation where you actually see that religious system depicted as a woman riding upon that beast. It's, 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 the Catholic system is in control. I mentioned there verse 7 and verse 19 this strange little comment that says that the fourth beast stamped the residue. Now what is the residue? The residue of something is what is left over. And what it's simply saying is is that the fourth beast will take that territory or at least that general area will be in control of that general area that was not taken originally by the Roman Empire. So we're looking for Russia as being the the military power of the Roman Empire at the time of the end 
to tread down in some way, to occupy in some way Iran, Iraq, Syria and and possibly even further east out in Afghanistan there. The residue, it's just interesting little comment that's mentioned. Notice the specific language in Daniel 7 up on the screen there. The ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings. So they are European horns. Verse 24 also says, another shall rise after them. So after the breakup of the Roman Empire, the little horn comes in. That's the, the papacy and its dominion, the Holy Roman Empire. And he shall wear out the saints. This is a persecuting power that continues through until Christ returns. There it is, the little blasphemous horn. The holy sea with the big eyes, they were able to see everything that was going on through the priesthood and through the confessional. And the mouth, of course, is what is the blasphemous words against the God of gods. Now, what we're seeing today, of course, is a revival of the power of the papacy, this little horn power in the earth. Or we could say of the woman that is about to ride the beast. There is a, a, a picture of not your every, everyday um, trip to the beach down in uh, Brazil, apparently about a million people on the beach and um, they've just come out to see the Pope. Of course, Pope Francis I is the first Jesuit Pope and we'll say a little bit about that in, in a minute. The Jesuits were set up by what was called the uh, Society of Jesus or the, or, um, yeah, the Society of Jesus or was named the Jesuits in the Counter-Reformation in the early 1600s by a man named Ignatius Loyola who was a military man who set out to destroy Protestantism by the sword and by um, education. And this, incredibly, that the, the Jesuits have been so extreme through the ages that they've at even some stages even been banned by the Catholic Church and the popes themselves have banned them for being too extreme and too violent. Never before has a Jesuit been pope. The current pope is the first Jesuit pope. And we're seeing headlines like this. Pope Francis is remaking the Vatican. It's a new Roman Empire, says Time. It's a new Roman Empire. Wherever he goes, people are flocking to see this popular man, the, f- the first Jesuit Pope. And if we s- I've heard a lot of people say, oh, but this Pope's different. He's actually a really nice guy. He's really incredibly tolerant. He's incredibly uh, tolerant of minorities. He's reaching out to people. Well, this is a Catholic publication only a couple of months ago which s- says that on the feast day, that's the feast day which is normally to celebrate the Jesuit founder, Ignatius Loyola, the Jesuit Pope praises his Jesuit founder. And that article said, amongst other things, Loyola, founder of the Society of Jesus, often called the Jesuits, was a Spanish soldier-turned-mystic who died in 1556 at the age of 64, who was beatified in 1609 and declared a saint on March the 12th, 1622. His feast day is celebrated on July the 31st, which is the reason why Francis sent out the tweet on Monday. So Francis is asking us, asking his followers, asking the world to follow the founder of the Jesuits. Now that's quite astounding because very, it does, takes very little, uh, very little effort to look at the history of the Jesuits. They were set up for the purpose of the Counter-Reformation, which was to destroy Protestantism, to wipe them out by the sword, but to bring Europe back into the clutches of the papacy through education and through whatever means is necessary. There's much more we could say about that. This Pope is a true Jesuit. He is a Jesuit who uses deception, who uses influence, power and political, particularly political power to bring about his ends and that is world domination by the Catholic Church. There he is in front of the painting. That painting is called the first, not the first, it's the last judgment. And there he is with the 27 leaders of Europe on the 60th anniversary of the Treaty of Rome. The Treaty of Rome, and we saw that actually in the video earlier. The Treaty of Rome was signed by six countries 
on the tallest of the seven hills of Rome, Capitoline Hill, in 1957. And there they are, the leaders of Europe, come to meet with the Pope in front of the last judgment on the 60th anniversary. Britain was not included with those 27 because it was only three days later that Theresa May read that document out in the British Parliament to say that they were leaving Babylon the Great. And we saw in our previous study the fact that Britain must leave that system because Britain is with Israel at the end, she is not with Rome. And that uh, headline there down the bottom from Reuters, just a, a screenshot there, says that the European Union seeks a pro post-Brexit unity by going back to its roots at Rome. Sixty years ago, Britain shunned the meeting in Rome where six war-scarred neighbours founded what became the EU. Again, Britain is not there. So the way that Reuters saw it was that the European nations sought a post-Brexit unity by meeting with the Pope in Rome and having a private audience with him. There they are. The symbolism of that is incredible. We are seeing the stage being set for really what will ultimately be the Pope's, the, the papacy's greatest um, grasp on power after Christ is in Jerusalem with the saints when the woman uh, begins to ride that beast and to bring the nations of Europe against Jesus Christ and the saints where they will meet their destruction as described in chapter 19 of Revelation. But now what about Russia? Because Russia is a very important part of this. It's really interesting that Russia is making inroads into and, and reaching out for some sort of alliance in some way with Europe. Now, I think this is quite... Um, in the, the way things are at the moment, there's a lot of work to do with that. I personally believe that the Islamic terrorism could change that all overnight. With the terrorist attacks that have been going on in Europe and other places, very easily Christian Europe, so-called, will join with Christian Russia. Vladimir Putin said that Russia is ready for unity with Europe. This is in the Russian press. Former German Chancellor, German Chancellor Helmut Kohl considered Russia and Europe should be together and Moscow is ready for such a unity. So Europe should aspire to that, said Mr Putin. If we want to keep our civilisation in this turbulent and rapidly changing world with growing centres of power, not only military power but also economic and cultural, then of course Europe and Russia should be together, he says. You know our position, which is that we are ready for this. We need our partners to be ready for that as well. They should get rid of phobias of the past. So Russia is certainly ready. What will it be? What will it make for Europe to become ready for that alliance? In Daniel chapter 8, we have some very interesting language and I've got this now up on the screen because Daniel chapter 8 goes back to the Hebrew language and uses the Hebrew language, whereas Daniel 2-7 to is the Chaldean language. Daniel 8 particularly shows the events in the, of the Roman Empire in context of Israel and the Holy Land. It says there in verse 23, In the latter time of their kingdom, that's the Greek kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power, Remember Jesus said to Pilate, you have no power unless it be given to you from above. Pilate was the Roman in the Middle East. He shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also he should cause craft to prosper. It means deceit, trickery. And he shall magnify himself in his heart. In other words, this is a proud system. And by peace he shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. That sounds like Daniel chapter 2, doesn't it? He shall be, it it's, the stone power is cut out without hands. The Roman Empire will exist not only in Western Europe, but also in the Middle East and will stand up against Jesus Christ himself. He's the Prince of Princes, or we could say Lord of Lords, using the language of Revelation 17. 
because the saints are with him when this happens. Jesus Christ and the saints are together when the battle of Armageddon occurs. The saints are taken from the world before Armageddon so that they are there to be with Jesus when we come to take the city of Jerusalem. Rotherham says, by their careless security will he destroy many. New King James says he will destroy many in their prosperity. And so we're looking for that system again in the Middle East, for Russia to move south into the Middle East, which really in in many ways it's already done, to use deceit, to use pride and use peace or careless security, lulling people into careless security, that they moves into Jerusalem to stand up against Jesus Christ and the saints. Now just a little aside for one moment. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is a New Testament scripture that uses the language of Daniel chapter 8. Have a look at this. Let no, look at the language. Let no man deceive you by any means for that day, that's the return of Christ, will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed. So Paul is saying that Jesus Christ cannot come back to the earth until one big event occurs in history and that is that the truth falls away. He opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. And it's using there very much a combination of the language of Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 11. He will cause deceit to prosper. He will be proud. We read tonight from Daniel 11 that actually says that he makes himself the subject of worship. And only a a few weeks back, the Australian newspaper had this heading. We will not... Fall. The Catholic Church may be under siege but it has survived worse in its long history and that was an article written by um, someone within the Catholic Church saying we will not fall. Revelation 18 says she will say in her heart I sit a queen and am no widow. How much has she glorified herself and lived deliciously so much torment and sorrow give her for she says in her heart I sit as a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. And so putting Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 together, we have a western horn and an eastern horn. We have the blasphemous little horn in Rome and we have the Roman Empire re-established in Constantinople when Russia takes that city, the language of of Revelation 16, the dragon and the beast. Daniel 7, the little horn of the fourth beast. Daniel 8, the little horn of of the goat. And here we have examples of this, I suppose, latter day manifestation of the Roman Empire, where we have these Eastern emperors joining with the papacy. That's why the, the, the eagle there, of course, has two heads. It's a double headed eagle. One is Daniel 7, one is Daniel 8. It has, notice there the flag, that's the Russian flag. Not only does it have the slaying of the dragon on a shield there, it has crowns on the heads of the eagles and in in the claws of the eagle on one side is the scepter indicating rulership, royal rulership. In the other claw, that's what you call it, is is, is the globe which represents the world with a cross on the top. Representing the latter-day Roman Empire, east and west, in control of the world and ruling. And we've seen only, um, we saw this in the video earlier, less than two years ago, almost a thousand years had gone past where without the head of the Eastern Orthodox Church in Russia ever even meeting with his counterpart in Rome. But the events in the Middle East that were caused by uprisings in the Middle East have brought these people together. These two leaders have taken almost a thousand years to get to the point where they can come to some agreement and it's because of Islamic 
terror extremism in the Middle East. And I believe that is what's prophetically, when you look at Revelation chapter 9, Revelation chapter 16, I believe it's extremism, uh, Islamic extremism, which will bring Russia and Europe together in alliance in the first instance. And that's what's already happening here. But there's another interesting aspect to this and you can see just on the bottom right, Mr Putin there with a headline saying religious diplomacy, this may be the actual goal of Vladimir Putin's visit to Greece. That Greece is a bankrupt state ready to be, I believe, ready to be taken over very soon by Russia. And it's saying it's religious diplomacy. Political leaders come together and a lot of it is all about religion, historical religious ties that bind those countries together. But of course the Greek Orthodox Church is very prominent in the city of Jerusalem. There's uh, some really interesting articles on this. There's quite a lot of conflict at the moment over Greek Orthodox land in the city of Jerusalem and there are certain court cases going on at the moment where the Greek Orthodox Church is aiming to block some of these Jerusalem property sales being uh, actually being sold. It's quite complicated but what you've got is quite a fight between the Israeli government and the Greek Orthodox Church. That's something I think we need to watch for because when God takes Jerusalem, it says in Ezekiel 36 that one of the things Gog says in Ezekiel 36 says even the holy sites are now in my possession. It's an argument over land in Jerusalem. Well, what about Daniel 11? Now, we've read Daniel 11. Let's go there. We read that tonight. We won't really go through all of this now, but notice the I've just got on the screen there, again, the re-emphasis on the fact that the Roman emperors and the popes the, the, the thing that's really emphasised over and over again is that they exalt themselves above every god. They make themselves the subject of worship. They don't just blaspheme against God, but they actually, first instance, they changed their religion. They didn't regard the God of their fathers, nor the desire of women, so there was a celibate priesthood. It says, nor regard any god, for he shall magnify himself above all. In other words, he the emperors and the popes made themselves the subject of worship. This is an extraordinary religion. Actually made themselves God, set themselves up in the temple of God. That's the language that's picked up by Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2. And there we have again this military, eastern military power, Roman power, with a western religious power. They changed their religion, but the, the and you can go back in history and show how the Eastern emperors in Constantinople honoured the Pope with gold and silver and precious stones and present things. He will do this with a strange God in Rome, which he will acknowledge and increase with glory. And that's what we're seeing today, a working together of Russia and the papacy. A God whom his fathers knew not is he honouring. And we have communist leaders in the leadership who previously were atheists, now honouring this strange God in Rome. And this headline on the Russian news site says Pope Francis sees Putin as the only man to defend Christians around the world. It says that in an attempt to defend Christians in the Middle East and other parts of the world where they're being persecuted, Pope Francis wants to ask Mr Putin for help. According to Francis, Putin is the only one to whom the Catholic Church can unite to defend Christians in the East. Why? because Russia has, is the prominent military power in the East. As it was in the days when the emperors ruled from Constantinople, we have a powerful military regime in, in the East that is doing the work of the papacy. This is only uh, a couple of months ago. This headline in a European publication that says why the Pope loves Putin. An increasingly belligerent Vladimir Putin is finding a new friend in a man of peace, Pope Francis, so-called. The Vatican Secretary of State, Mr Cardinal Parolin, is scheduled to fly to Moscow on August the 20th to meet the Russian President and Patriarch Kirill, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church. And a sub-headline, Rome, 
Constantinople and Moscow says, Russian conservatives have even resurrected Tsarist rhetoric of Moscow as the third Rome, a centre for imperial Christianity, the second being Constantinople. Middle Eastern Christians tend to be close in belief and history to the Russian Orthodox Church, said a Vatican analyst at the Rome newspaper. So at a time when Christians are threatened in that region, the Holy See may appreciate a Russian president presence that tries to defend them. Notice the way the Europeans are thinking. Catholics are thinking that if we can get a military leader who is close in cultural background and in religion and who identifies with Christians in the Middle East, then he can be our champion. And that's what Russia's doing in Syria. And a few days later, Cardinal Paralin went to, the, to Moscow. In fact, he didn't go to Moscow. He went to, again to Sochi, where they seemed to meet, on the Black Sea. And he came away saying Russia has a key responsibility in brokering world peace. By that he means overthrowing Islamic terrorism in Syria and Iraq. In other words, we're going to see a re-emergence of the Roman Empire in the eastern part of the empire, which is Syria, Iraq and ultimately Turkey. In Daniel chapter 11, we read that Russia will invade Egypt with many ships. We don't have time really tonight to go into detail about what is going on in Egypt, except that there is a very strong Russian influence. Russia is expanding its influence in Egypt and uh, this year it's become even more and more pronounced. There's pictures of the Russian president all the way down the streets in Egypt. It's quite dramatic what's actually happening. It's... um, um, if anyone's interested, I've got some uh, one or two video clips on what's happening there. It's quite astounding. All right, let's go back now, I suppose, to Russia in Syria because when I say go back, we did look at this briefly in our first study. But this is really where Russia's power is being projected now. And why, what was, is so interesting to us to see Russia in Syria is the fact that at the time of the end there will be the king of the north in existence once again. See, it says in Daniel 11, at the time of the end the king of the south shall push at him and the king of the north shall come against him, that's Constantinople, like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. Now, however you may read that, what it's saying is at the time of the end there will be a king of the south and there will be a king of the north re-established again. I remember uh, Brother Graham Pierce many decades ago in one of his publications he said, this is the point where we have a merging of the little horn of the goat and the king of the north. He says that they become one and the same power and that's absolutely right. The king of the north, Russia in Syria, takes Constantinople and becomes the little horn of the goat. So we need to see the king of the north in existence when Christ comes. And when Russia moved into Syria at the end of September 2015, within a few weeks this was one of the headlines. Putin's turning the Syrian coast into another Crimea. And of course, um, it says the Orthodox Church called it a holy battle and it said, get ready for Russia to cast itself as the protector Russia has always seen itself as the third Rome and the last standard bearer of Christianity. New York Post. It says the same thing. Here's some headlines from the weeks that followed Russia moving into Syria. War on terror is sacred. Orthodox Church praises Putin's decision on Syrian airstrikes. That was an official statement of the Russian Orthodox Church. The Church declares war on ISIS a holy war, says Reuters. Business Insider said we're witnessing the most significant new Russian military foothold in the Middle East in decades. Top Syrian Catholic bishop said in early 2016 that the Russian operation in Syria is our salvation. The majority of Syrian people support Moscow's anti-terror campaign, he said, adding that it's not only military assistance but the promotion of a peace process by Russia. Now, isn't that fascinating considering the language of Daniel chapter 8? Leaders of the Catholic and Russian Orthodox churches have held a historic meeting in Cuba 
After the first ever face-to-face talks, a joint declaration was signed in which special attention is given to the situation in the Middle East. That's what brought them together. And here we have pictures of um, military priests in Russia blessing the um, bombs and the weapons that are to be used in the war on ISIS. And the headline there says in the Economist magazine, says, why would he stop now? This is a holy war. It has been a holy war. And Russia is certainly now starting to get on top. Now here is the alliance. That's just a screenshot from one of the um, documentaries or one of the news um, reports. It shows the Joint Information Centre, the war on ISIS, with a map there showing Syria. And up the top it's got the four flags. Russia, Iran, Iraq and Syria. That's the Joint Information Centre. As that uh, general said, that Russian military man said, he already has that alliance, that he's now just putting the icing on the cake. And so the ships come through the Bosphorus. A few months ago, it says they're watching Russian Syrian build up from central Istanbul. And you can, apparently, people just sit there and just watch the ships just streaming through the Bosphorus on the way to Syria. Newsweek says Russia, not the US, is now calling the shots in the Middle East with Iran and Iraq. The US's influence in Iraq may also be waning in Russia's favour. Last week, the Iraqi Vice President visited Moscow to make an appeal for close relations with Russia in order to balance the US and its agenda. Just two days earlier, the Iraqi Defence Minister met with his Iranian counterpart to talk about greater cooperation between the two countries. So now we have Iraq getting involved with Russian leadership. They're calling on Russia to take a greater leadership role in Iraq. Of course, Iran, only a year ago, for the first time in many decades, allowed a foreign power access to its military, uh, sorry, its um, air bases in Iran. But this is an article uh, from this year, earlier this year, that says that Russian military can now bomb Syrian rebels and ISIS from Iran. So Iran have given Russia the authorisation to bomb Islamic extremists using Iranian air bases. And really we could say that this is the first steps of the fourth, first steps uh, literally, of the fourth beast starting to tread the residue that area of the old Medo-Persian Empire where we're starting to see that Roman influence come into that region. But now we have Russia deploying troops to the Syrian Golan Heights, says the Times of Israel, and many other articles you can go and have a look at there. And in fact, you can actually see Quinetra there, right on the Golan, there are Russian troops within sight of Israel's land. Russia's deploying troops to southern Syria near the Israeli border. It's building a military base in the area of Quenetra and Diara on the Syrian side of the Golan Heights. The Syrian army is withdrawing from the area which has been a rebel stronghold throughout the bloody civil war. Now isn't that amazing that we've now got Russian bases, military bases within sight of the Israeli border. Surely we are now seeing a heavy build-up of what will become the King of the North, what is rapidly becoming the King of the North, Russia in Syria, for the final conflict. And look at just these headlines. What about Libya? They're keen on exerting his country's influence on, in conflict warn, warn Libya. Russia's extending its Middle East reach with an eye on Libya, says the Jerusalem Post. The Moscow Times says that Libya is Russia's new front line. Russia's ur- urging calm after the Libyan strongman it backs takes the oil ports. And that was back in March. General Haftar, who is backed by Russia, has taken the majority of the country and in March took over the oil ports of Libya. He's, Mr Haftar is now calling on Russian military assistance in Libya and also assistance for recreating a leadership of the whole of Libya. 
Libyan oil liberator is aiming to boost Russian ties. And you can look at this. These are, these are just business sites to do with oil. Libyan National Army Commander Khalifa Haftar, the man responsible for recapturing the country's oil ports and essentially restarting production, is meeting top officials in Moscow. That's in, just in August. Numerous trips have been made to, to Moscow by Mr Haftar to secure Russian a power grab in, in Libya. Russia is eyeing a rapid Middle East energy expansion. See, it's not just all about military, it's about business, it's about finance, it's about world domination, control of energy. And these, this is, these are just business magazines. Russian companies are now destined to embark upon a new expansion, this time in the Middle East. With the recently imposed US sanctions further impacting Russia's ability to form partnerships with Western majors, Iran, Iraq and possibly even Syria will become the new hub of a Russian oil-related investments. These countries are immensely rich in oil, yet lacking the funds necessary to exploit it. So in comes Russia to take the oil of Libya, Iran, Iraq and Syria. Now that's exactly all those territories we're looking for in, D in the book of Daniel. And there's a headline talking about what we were talking about just earlier, that Baghdad has sought a substantial Russian military and political presence in, in Iraq. Now, that's astounding. It's not just a military presence to fight, not just a military presence to actually fight ISIS. They're actually asking Russia to become involved in their political system in Iraq. In other words, the Iraqis are wanting a, a level of Russian control in their government. Ezekiel 38 verse 7 says, be thou a guard unto them or a protector. And what did Russia say? Russia said, um, the Speaker of Russia's Upper House of Parliament responded by saying Russia is determined to expand its interaction with Iraq both politically and economically as well as in the te military technical sphere. Oh, and of course on the parliamentary level. So we're going to see Russia now take control of Iraq as well. We haven't got information up uh, tonight on Afghanistan but the Americans have been shocked earlier this year when they have seen that the Taliban are now being, are starting to be armed by Russia as well and they're making inroad, strong inroads to control Afghanistan. But of course Russia's desire for Constantinople is what they really want. That Russia has, since 1453, since the Turks took Constantinople, Russia has always wanted to put the Russian flags back on the St Sophia's Cathedral or it's currently a museum but it used to be a cathedral. And when Russia moves in and takes Constantinople and I say most likely after Christ has come, most likely, the way things are going at the moment things seem to be happening before Christ's coming that we thought may have been after but certainly before Armageddon Russia will take Constantinople and it's interesting to read Russian headlines like this in Russian media. If Erdogan starts confronting Moscow, it will bury Turkey. See, they're, they're talking about it. There's a lot of dispute, a lot of dispute about the St. Sophia's Cathedral and who should control it. Dispute between um, Muslims in Turkey, secular um, people in Turkey and also the re religious people. And this is what I really want to finish on now. What does the Orthodox Church say about this? Well, the Orthodox Church has a plan to retake Constantinople. Officially, that, that is what they've always planned for many hundreds of years. In fact, if you look at the Russian churches, the Russian churches have a, uh, on the top of all the churches, they have a cross over the top of a crescent, which refers to the day when they believe the church will retake Constantinople. But this is what the Orthodox Church says in, on their official site website in England. The liberation of Constantinople will happen. Then the last liturgy in the Church of the Holy Wisdom, Hagia Sophia, will be completed. Then the Kurds, Armenians, Greeks and Syrians will all see justice. The question therefore arises is 
What will happen to the Patriarch of Constantinople once the city has been liberated by Russia? Clearly, Russia will hand it and its surrounding territory over to the Greek nation to whom it belongs. Russia will have no interest in keeping it since its real interest is Jerusalem and the Holy Land where one million Russians live. In the language of Daniel 11, we could say he shall overflow and pass over. And what did Paul say in Romans? He said, when the enemy comes in like a flood, using that language of Daniel, when the enemy comes in like a flood, he will raise up a standard against him. In in, in Romans chapter 11, and, and Paul says that this is the day when I will turn them away from their sins. What a wonderful day that is, brothers and sisters. Now what is what I really want to finish with is the Lord Jesus Christ because that is the most important thing about all of what we've been considering. Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. He says, blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments. He is knocking at the door. Now what is beautiful about that is that that is taken from the Song of Solomon, the principle where the beloved came and would put the myrrh on the door handle for his fiancée to come to the door handle and smell that sweet-smelling myrrh on the door handle as a message to his bride that he loves her. And what a beautiful concept. We often think of a stand at the door and knock as something that is maybe a a worrying thing or something that would shock us. But the principle taken from Scripture is one of the Lord Jesus Christ who has an incredible love for his ecclesia. He is standing at the door and he is knocking because he wants to be married to his bride. And I think, brothers and sisters, what we can take away from these events that we've seen in the world is the incredible comfort to know that all the trials and the stresses of life, the problems that we encounter, the, the, the problems of our mortality, the sadness and the grief will soon be taken away when the Lord Jesus Christ indeed, he is knocking at our door now but the wonderful thing is we long for that day when that door will actually be opened and let us pray that uh, that day will be very soon and let us long for that day and help each other towards that wonderful day. Thank you. Full day. Thank you.